Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk about politics, we're going to talk about COVID-19, we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, we're going to talk about uh, universal basic income. I'm with James Case. Welcome to Face to Face, James. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. So give us a quick background of um, uh, what you do. Uh, I know you are in uh, election mode in, uh, in Harlem, so... Well, yeah, I'm, I'm running for U.S. Congress here in New York's 13th District. Uh, that's everything in northern Manhattan and the northwest Bronx, and election day is Tuesday. So we're uh, sort of preparing for that. But uh, aside from that, uh, you know, I've been, I've been in the streets a lot, um, sort of doing work via the, the Keith Institute with uh, a Juneteenth march. We produced a pretty large Juneteenth march last Friday. And uh, a few other marches just to, you know, add some extra resources and, and, and help the, the marchers uh, do it safely, uh, you know, because COVID-19 is still uh, terrorizing our communities. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I've sort of been balancing. So, so, yeah, that was a little bit my, my story. I wanted to see how did you see this Black Lives Matter and then the, the, the last protest in the context of the, the U.S. discrimination against African American, and and we will go to basic income to see uh, how does it take a new shape in that uh, context. How how did you see the last event? How do you um, because it's nothing new more or less here. It's not a new situation, but things seems to be have another proportion. Sure. Well, I think, you know, more people are aware, right? And I think the, the murder of George Floyd was a big uh, turning point for non-Black people, uh, not just white people, but I think all people that don't identify as Black here in America, you know, seeing that murder sort of triggered something in, in all of them. And, you know, there, there are decades or centuries even where where nothing happens. And then there are days and weeks where it seems like, centuries happen. And at this point, uh, we're seeing a lot happen all at once. In New York alone, we've seen about seven or so different legislative changes at the state and at the city level. That's a good thing. Uh, but I think we're starting to see a, a new class of activists, especially younger people, uh, getting involved in politics through their marches for justice, sort of transitioning that fight for justice into a fight for real tangible political power and also economic access are the faces that we see in these marches. You know, when I look out at the marches, not just here in New York, but across the country, I see a lot more white faces than black faces. And that wasn't the case in say the 1960s. And I see a lot more corporations uh, adding fuel to the fire by making corporate holidays. The state of New York's employees are witnessing a holiday as well. And so, our ability to leverage what Juneteenth means uh, per these marches uh, is, I think, a new opportunity to talk about economic inclusion in a way that we never really could before. Uh, you know, Juneteenth is very much so about, you know, the freedom and emancipation of slaves, and it invokes uh, a, a need to consider what slavery was, and it was the capitalization of human bodies uh, here on American soil. Uh, not that uh, you know, discount or uh, fail to include all of the places outside the United States that uh, benefited from slavery. So we'll move forward from these protests for justice into a broader political conversation about economic inclusion and power. And I think that's but a good I will, thing. I will argue with you that the capitalism economical society has never been as concentrated and as uh, uh, limited to few, really few people in some ways, and yeah. and the distribution is far from being on the right direction. So, um, and the discrimination, I think it's it is still very very there and active and and in in many many situations and even for the African American workers, I mean it's really complicated situation right now. Totally, totally. I mean, I just think. You know, specific to that, uh, the only way to change that, you know, to, to change that discrimination, I still think leadership matters, not only leadership in rhetoric, but leadership in policy. And if we can create systems that require equity to be distributed 
equity not only from an economic standpoint, but also from a decision-making standpoint, right? Uh, so whether we're talking about the corporate level or at the political level, ensuring that people have a tangible voice and are able to exercise that voice to state what markets and products and democracy should look like is, you know, that, that's the way forward. And I think we have more than a few solutions to that, uh, some of which I propose, you know, during my political campaign, but also some I think we'll, we'll carry forward with. So, so there are ways to fight this systemic racism and discrimination. And now that it's on people's radar, now that it's uh, part of the political lexicon, I think we can start to solve some of those problems and chip away at the oppressive system. And, uh, and I'm hopeful about that. I think we're, we're in a good spot relative to where we were. So let, let, let's, let's see, because you were a big uh, supporters and, and on the platform, you, uh, you fight for uh, universal basic income. How do yeah. you see this uh, now facing with the, the COVID-19 and the pandemic and the fact that, you know, 40% of the business in African-American has been uh, going on there during the pandemic? Knowing then we are at uh, 23 or 25 percent of unemployment. From there, I will say 60 percent are uh, African American and Latino communities. How, yeah. how do you see this this uh, uh, universal basic income being grounded in the U.S. or how the how the the situation? There are two different ways to look at a, a universal basic income being implemented. There's the there's the moral argument and there's the functional argument. I think the moral argument is that, you know, COVID-19 is attacking black and brown communities more than any other community. And I think powerful interests, our president, who I think is a racist, are allowing the disease to terrorize our communities, for lack of better phrases. Uh, maybe that is the best phrase. And so there's a moral argument to be made about uh, propping up people's intrinsic value via some tangible income, and that would be a basic income, especially as the vast majority of products and services in this country are built for and by, you know, people of color across the board. Uh, so that's one argument. The, the other functional argument of how we actually uh, cater to that problem, I think, is one of finding a new way to distribute capital in yeah. general to people. Yeah. And so I think that the best way to do that is to create a new asset class that can distribute a universal equity stake in corporate productivity to individuals. And I think that we've never seen uh, a, a better storyline for why this is necessary than now. So what COVID-19 really provided us is a use case for how interconnected society is, number one, and how we only really create economic value based on the transactions of our interconnected society. And those transactions are made with data between people, conversations that we have, commerce that we'd like to have, you name it. And the moment that we all went home and started quarantining and staying away from each other, we saw the economy tank. So it validates the idea that we have an intrinsic value, that we only derive it from each other, and hopefully where we go forward is that we can start to pay people an equity stake in that value that we derive from each other. And I think that the way we do that is by giving everyone uh, an equity stake, a sort of stock share in American productivity. And I think we can do that via the tangible good that is their collective personal data. If we look across the board at how information about individuals are used to create products and services at the corporate level, then we can start to look at what corporations are making and pull back some of that uh, profit that they generate off of us and distribute it back into the communities. I'm just trying to, to uh, see the analysis uh, uh, after the COVID-19, who, who has been really uh, um, showing two things. One is we are in economical society. So everybody depends on this economical circuit of money and so on and so forth and and yeah. and no one can live without being part of that and we saw yeah. people who have no income for months who have been uh and end up homeless who have been who lost their job who lost 
uh, everything else who is connected to that, and and the yeah. political power who has no capacity to really provide any resources in 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 immediate. I mean, where the need is. I mean. Uh, they didn't distribute any ATM card to people. They didn't distribute any basic income immediately. And and they wanted to set up some complicated story of banking register and so on who are far away from right. the situation so then people are living. So uh, uh, really the, the lesson, I think, we, and, and, and the basic income notion that you are presenting could uh, definitely answer that question. Yes, but it has to be done before uh, and it has to be done for uh, well, everyone and for and, and, and not for crisis situation but just because people are living into an economical society. Right. Well, I think the, the main reason, right, that we need one for everyone is because, you know, folks are hurting on both ends. Folks that I don't agree with politically are, are also hurting. You know, I think Trump had a, a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma yesterday and is essentially willing to kill his most faithful followers. Yeah. Um, so they're following him out of really an economic fear yeah. of becoming obsolete or yeah. becoming uh, less valuable. And I think the opportunity of a universal basic income is to tell those people and all people that they do have an intrinsic value, that we do value their input to the economy, and that this money is money that they're owed and that we're trying to make them whole with by having them participate in the productivity of the economy. Now. The mechanics of how I like to look at that is really via what I, I call a data dividend. And the data dividend is essentially an equity stake in the information that all companies use to scale. Now, to put that into perspective, there are about 5.3 million companies in the United States alone. Last year, they generated about $7.2 trillion in profits. That's after they paid taxes. And more than 75% of that money, right around 75% of that money is gonna go into a dividend to corporate shareholders. But we know that corporations only grow based on data from either consumers or their employees, but it's all personal data. It all comes down to an individual. Some individual or group of individuals have identified that products and or services are necessary for them to grow. And we can break that down into the data points. So my argument going forward is that that 70%, 75% of the $7.2 trillion that American corporations generate, uh, generated at least in 2019, but they do this every year, that we're owed half of that. And that's about, uh, if you're doing the math, that's about $2.7 trillion that is, I think, available to go back into people's pockets and start to refuel the economy. Now, it won't solve everything. We'll still need to pay for, you know, health care and infrastructure and education infrastructure as we start to, you know, get the economy back on its feet. But there is a necessary sort of moral contract that has to be established by the leadership in any economy. And it has to be one that stems from a place that suggests or insists that people are good and valuable. And right now, I think a lot of people are coupling their value to the job that they don't have or the wage that they won't be getting. And I think the, the most noble thing that we can do uh, as leaders, as communicators in this society is tell people just how valuable they are and that we're doing the work of trying to distribute that value back to them. And uh, disconnected so and disconnected work from economical resources, because I think the notion of Work being the products, the, pro, the the producer of money. It's a fake. Yeah. It, it's it's a false promises because this doesn't work like this. Money comes from other sources than just work. I think it's rooted in slavery. Actually, I mean, it's sort of like a new sort of that's job true. slavery. I think that's that you're most, totally right. The most devastating thing, especially if you're sort of a middle wage earner or what we call middle class, and you're white and you live in the middle of the United States, you know, finding out that you're a wage slave has got to be devastating. And I'm saying that as an outsider looking in, you know, as a, as a black man looking at these folks. And, you know, even though we may not always agree on everything politically, I, I do think that is morally inept, but also politically dangerous to allow the majority of a population, any population, 
start to understand their value as only being related to the type of work that they can get and and even sort of uh, other benefits that they would have, like access to certain sorts of welfare and healthcare and you name it, those being related to how we classify how they're working. Most of the time when people go for welfare benefits, they have to show the city or the state that they're looking for a job <laughs> or that they're retooling. You know, it's like we will only pay for folks to show us how they're trying to enslave themselves and work again. And that is, again, politically and morally dangerous. And it's dividing us as a country. So, again, and I then, think... And if, if people don't want to work, I mean, what is... If we have machines who do the work for us, what is wrong with people who are doing other things than working into a, a certain set of uh, rules yeah. in, in corporations who are treating people badly? I mean, I am more volunteer. I spend more time doing volunteer work of uh, labor of love than sure. making money. I mean, it's, 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 I, I don't I think volunteer it. work is, is valuable, right? It's, it's, it's certainly valuable. And we even see that, see that in the numbers. I think, again, how we classify work matters as well. So when I say work, I'm thinking about, you know, physical toiling, you know, with your hands and feet. And that typically is how we think about work. But the majority of the workforce these days are, you know, in the service sector. So people are using soft skills, they're using communications, they're doing project management. And even where automation is possible, right, whether it's automating of machines or streamlining of business processes to automate that work, I will say we haven't seen, in just in the numbers, a loss of jobs. We've just seen a loss of wages. So before COVID-19 yeah. happened, you know, I think if you ask any labor economist, and I'm on board with them, they would say, we have more jobs than we've ever had. The yeah, problem yeah. is they don't pay anything. I agree. And so people should be able to do the work that they like or do even some work that they feel like is necessary to pay some bills because Absolutely. they're getting paid for that. But they should also get an equity stake post-work. And the reason that really matters is not even just for the standard basic incomes that come out there, but if you have certain companies that pay their fair share of the universal basic income, that $2.7 trillion, there may be other benefits that should go back to employees of that company to say they've toiled away and provided some input to that company for a wage. So that's money for time. It's like a retainer for your time. Then after that input has happened, that product or service goes out into the market and it is valuable for whatever reason. As it is valuable, if that value exceeds what the owner of the corporation's share is, some of that access value should go back to that employee. So that's another form of a basic income on top of a universal basic income that should be paying people. The problem in society is not the way we work or how we work or even that machines are coming. The problem is how we identify ownership of productivity. And that comes back to the movement for Black Lives and Juneteenth, which is really a movement and a celebration of freedom because all of our assessment of productivity over the course of the past millennia has been one of the ownership class owning productivity no matter who makes it and in this case i'm saying at least per the last three weeks we're we're having a big national argument about how much productivity black people black slaves in particular gave to this country and you can extrapolate that out into the 21st century and look at how much valuable wage slaves have been given the country in general. And so I think the way we move forward is not one of capitalism or not one of socialism per se, but it's, I think, one of an inclusionism where we include people in the ownership structure and the equity stakes of this country and its productivity. I mean, That's it was proposed in some way, way in, in cooperatives, um, in some form of cooperative, that was also the way to, uh, to, to go on that direction. I mean, now it will be interesting to see it as a social level and not just at the economical uh, struggle. Totally. My, my argument is yeah. uh, to see it as a human right. And because sure. uh, as a human being born into that society of today's society with an economical society, no one can survive without access to economical resources. I agree. Meaning, meaning then we are known 100 years ago where I had a backyard and I could grow my tomatoes and have a chicken and the eggs and I can 
more or less, you know, go by about that system. That word right. is gone and is gone maybe forever until we, we prove the contrary. Right. We don't have it anymore. And we don't have it anymore. Right. And people are living and moving into cities. And so, so and we saw it with the COVID-19. If people are, are, don't have access to resources, they cannot live. And yeah. Because of that, I think even before democracy and access to vote or before even knowing and access to education, people should have access to a minimum of income to guarantee that they have the right condition to live. So that's Definitely. a bit right. right. To guarantee, you know, housing, health and, and food or housing, food and health, like those basic needs at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Right. And you're right. You make a good point. The world at this point in time is a big supply chain and it's how we provide high quality inexpensive goods and services to people fast and you're right the world used to work where if you had a couple of chickens maybe a cow and you had a nice plot of land you were at least able to survive right? and you can exchange it with somebody else with a neighbor who has a, oh, who has a right? cucumber and then you give you tomatoes and then you could i mean it, it, it's it's but a little bit uh, simplified but i'm i'm People get the gesture of that story. That's no, but it's, gone. A, it's a good reference. You're right. I think it's a good reference. But now that sort of, fo just to use them as a as an example, but they're not the only one, and they're obviously not, you know, they're not the only ones. But if we say Amazon has turned to the new chicken and eggs and in, in, you know, two acres of land, uh, then we need an equity stake in that supply chain to ensure that we can buy the basic goods to be able to survive. I think if, again, and the basic income is the floor, uh, but it has to be a moral floor, exactly. as you said, it has to and be- That's why I'm right. making as a human right, as the sure. same that's level or even, right. even stronger than vote or education yep. because of that context. To go back to Amazon's story. So we learned not too long ago than 40% of the African-American businesses have been gone under. But yep. my problem is this business went to Amazon. So it, it's, that's where I get, for me, it gets so uh, uh, upsetting Then it's not just communities have lost their resources and their social fabric right there, but it's also it went somewhere else where people have no control and have no access and who treat African-American very badly, where people are in food stamp and so on and so forth. So really, uh, that's where I, I, I have always this question, how can we fight that story? Well, the best way to fight it, in my opinion, is to, there's a lot of words, a lot of syllables I'm getting ready to use, but we have to decentralize and democratize those large institutions. Because you're absolutely right, the majority of Black-owned businesses were small businesses. But again, a lot of minority communities, ethnically minority at least in the United States, run small businesses and their businesses get consumed by these big supply chains, which Amazon is the biggest, Alibaba is another one, All right? So if you want to run an Asian American business, you may, a lot of your goods and how you distribute those may have been consumed by Alibaba and like services. So the only way to really balance that power or to answer your question is to solve a distribution problem with regards to how we distribute uh, capital that is consumed by the supply chain that we would normally have in our communities. And making an argument for UBI from a human rights standpoint alone is never enough. So that's what we've been doing in the basic income movement. I've, I've only been in this movement for say the past 15 years, but you know, I was talking with uh, you know, a few folks who have been working on this for 50 years, et cetera. And of course there are people who've been talking about it for hundreds of years. The moral right alone is not enough to beat the skeptics and the naysayers who are both you know, conservative and liberal about how we move forward. We have to have a tangible supply chain of how we pull that money back that seems ethically uh, from a business standpoint. And I think again, that comes back to uh, ownership of the core input to that supply chain, which is not chicken and eggs, it's actually individual's data which can predict demand for chicken and eggs. So if I can give people ownership of demand, then as I supply that demand and productivity happens, again, productivity is really a measure of revenues. After companies pay their taxes, which they should, they're left with profits. 
which is a reduced productivity, they owe us some of that money. And so the more that we can communicate that in policy, in academia, and then translate that into political language, like the fact that this should be a human right, especially in a time that is so desperate, like right now where people will get it, um, then I think we start to we start to come into the 21st century and we start to win some of these political arguments. I think that's exactly but, but where we're going. I totally agree. I mean, I'm not arguing with that. I'm just arguing about the human rights story where people are losing their connection to their human right. If you, yeah. if you see the connection with human right and the right to vote, I mean, many, many states who are questioning that story altogether. I mean, and the same with education and people want to go to private education because because they are not understanding the notion of human rights of as a human being and as creator of the society, I need to define the right of the society, of the human in that society to have access to education or vote or so on and so forth. And, and I think this relationship is a little bit broken by the, 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 the privatization of everything in between who become uh, people have to buy things to be able to have access to things. I think, again, I, I agree. The, the only problem is right distributing the ideology, the ideal, uh, you know, saying like uh, an ideal situation, it is your human right to have access to a certain amount of capital per society. The way we distribute those messages are usually through people's political and faith affiliations. Perfectly. And, and so I think the work, really the reason I ran for, for Congress yeah, yeah. Uh, was to talk to more faith leaders up here maybe like mainly the Abrahamic faiths, you know, the, the Christians, yep. uh, the Jews, and the Muslims who are up here in my neck of the woods. I can't talk to everybody. I'm, so I'm talking to the people I know yep. about this as a human rights issue. Yep. And as long as we can make that a, a constant cultural conversation, then people will start to go, hmm, I agree. And they'll come over to our side. So again, the work there is, that's leadership work. And, you know, sort of lobbying more leaders to talk like how we speak. Uh, again, I think we're getting there, but it will take it will take that heavy lifting to do that because we are also living in a society where there's a lot more diversity now in how people identify leadership and language that they're willing to follow. And everyone is not going to sort of one place or one house to get their political beliefs anymore. So we have to raise a rainbow coalition of folks who speak about these issues differently to actually change the minds of the general public. But we're doing that. For yeah. this interview, uh, we catch up yeah. later. Good luck for uh, your campaign and uh, for yeah. uh, the voting. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, hope to see you very soon. That was yeah. your show Face to Face. And please keep watching your news on Presenza.com. And to see you very soon. Thank you very much.